Hey, thanks for joining us on this midday hump week of the, the conference. Hump, hump day of the conference, yes, exactly. Hump day of the month. Um, welcome to our really longly titled Microsoft HDI is a big data and interoperability platform to drive point of care decisions at, in oncology at Levine Cancer Institute. You've probably never heard of us. <laughs> We're Wait, you can check. Wait, have anybody heard of us? Hey, hey, hey thanks, hi. There yeah. you go. Uh, Carolina's Healthcare System. We are the second largest public not for profit healthcare system in the nation. Now, there's a lot of caveats on that, but the first largest is the VA. Can't so beat the government. Can't beat the government. There you go. Uh, we have more than 40 hospital locations and 900 care locations across all of North Carolina, South Carolina, and now we're expanding out in other states. Our main thing is that we want to connect and transform. We want to provide care that's closer to where our patients live, so we don't want you to have to travel to get your cancer care. The problem statement we tried to solve was genomic reports are hard to find in the medical record. The reports are difficult to read. They're often between 26 and 30 pages long. They require manual effort to summarize. They present Presenting relevant clinical trials to providers when making treatment decisions will increase clinical trial participation, which was one of our goals for 2020. And as a center of excellence for the American Society of Clinical Oncologies, ASCO's targeted agent and profile utilization re registry, TAPER, clinical trial, our clinical outcomes and treatment data has to be reported back to the center of excellence. There will be a test on all those acronyms. That's right. Later. Healthcare, we come with our own acronyms. I actually don't know what they mean. I'm just the IT guy. So. Hey, you're not just the IT guy. Yeah. You're the IT Sherpa. Yeah, that's me. Okay. The objective of LINK was to provide an integrated, LINK stands for LCI Integrated Knowledge Base, another name by committee. Um, it's to provide interoperability of data between our different data silos, specifically to address that each of these silos contain relevant data and that we need to, as everybody else does, move the meaning along with the data. So when we say Apple, what we're talking about, they worked for Apple, they worked on the computer Apple, they ate a fruit Apple. We had four people, we all had day jobs, and we needed to get this up and running fast. So our vision for Link, as illustrated here, uh, was it would be an interoperability cluster. We have all sorts of data sources that live outside our EMR. We have lots of variety of data. So we have data that is in structured, unstructured format. We have notes, we have clinical data, we have pathways data, we have clinical trials data. We need to be able to talk bi-directionally to our CMR, which is in Salesforce, our Office 365 site, and we get all of our genomic testing or about 95% of it done externally. So we wanted to focus on a molecular tumor board. What is hey, it? I, I did want to make a point. Oh, by the way, okay. I'm, I'm Lance, in case you couldn't figure out by the names who was yeah, who. Yeah, I'm hard. Victoria. I figured yeah. it was pretty obvious. Yeah. So the, um, what, I did want to make a point here that we're not the traditional Hadoop. We did the really, you know, we had a lot of data, right? It was really yeah. big. We actually use this in a way that was, we needed to bring a bunch of disparate data, which, you know, the slide pr 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 uh, shows well, and, um, and, and crunch it together. So, and we did all this with Microsoft Azure, uh, as, as the um, talk uh, tells you. And it was very interesting to us, because we didn't have any, last year was our first year at this conference, right? So we didn't really know what we were doing. We kind of know what we were doing now, but we really didn't know what we were doing last year. And, and, and the, the, uh, the, the capability in HD Insights was very helpful. But to me, this was a, a little unique, and you'll, hopefully you'll see this later on, that, that it wasn't really like a really big data problem. It was like, I want to try to figure out what to do with Hadoop and how to crunch it all in a very quick time frame. But Victoria will show, show a little bit of that later. Yeah, so it's not your basic, let's do analytics and then report on something later kind of thing. It was, let's have it up in front at the providers so that they can make a decision. So what is a molecular tumor board, since we're going to talk about that? So a regular tumor board is where doctors get together and they discuss a particular disease site. So you might have a lung tumor board or a breast tumor board. A molecular tumor board transcends all those. So you'd be talking about patients with all different kinds of cancers, but you'd be talking only really about the kind of mutations that they had in their DNA. 
Most often, we talk about the TAPER, which was one of the acronyms from the second slide, because of our participation in the CEO, the Center of Excellence. What TAPER was trying to do is, and this is a really novel concept in oncology, we have all sorts of drugs that we give you depending on the kind of disease you have. So you have breast cancer, you get these drugs. You have, I don't know, liver yeah. cancer, you get these drugs. Now, what with precision medicine and the advances we've made in biomarkers and genomic testing, we now know that if you have this BRCA2 mutation in your breast cancer, you will respond really well for, to this particular drug. So we'll give you that drug first for your breast cancer. And what Taper is saying is, well, it doesn't really matter where the tumor is. If I have a tumor on my liver and it has a BRCA2 mutation, what if I gave you the breast cancer medication that worked really well on the BRCA2 tumor for breast cancer? Would it help fix your liver cancer? Because there's lots of diseases that aren't as sexy that don't have as many drugs, like liver cancer. So it's alternative options for treatment. So at a molecular tumor board, what ends up happening is patients are presented by the providers. So the provider stands up, he talks about his patient by their initials, he presents their clinical history, relevant information about their diagnosis, and then you get to see a summary of their genomics, what was wrong, what kind of mutations they had, what issues they're having, and then some options on clinical trials. And as a group, they all decide with some genomic experts, what's the best possible clinical trial for this patient? Oh, did, did you, genomics on the tumor, not yeah. the genomics of the whole person, okay, so just we'll, to be clear. Yeah, we're doing tumor genomics, not whole person genomics. And uh, we're doing liquid and solid tumors, but this is mainly focused on solid tumors. Liquid tumors are like when you have myeloma in your blood. The other part of the molecular tumor board is they review every result they'd gotten back the previous week and looked at were there mutations that there were specific trials available for, even if the doctor didn't ask, that we might want to remind the doctor that there's an opportunity for a clinical trial for that patient. So how does it all start? Well, if you go back to our original, this is our vision of what LINK looks like. We have our point of care clinical decision support for the doc when he's trying to decide what kind of treatment to give you. And that's in our electronically available anywhere pathways, our EA pathways app, which we've got embedded in our EMR, which is Cerner, using FireSmart. And all the smart doctors have gotten together and said, here's the best course of action. So this ties in with our evidence-based care approach where it doesn't matter where you live, or whether you're seeing a senior oncologist or a baby oncologist who's just out of medical school, you're gonna get the same standard of care. So we're driving that through standardized practices. So the doctors just walk through this flow sheet and the doctors decided what this flow sheet would look like. And then the green beakers represent open clinical trials and they can hover over them. There, where's the, they can hover over the beakers to see information about them. They click on them and it launches a clinical trial request. And for the genomics side, if they want to order a genomics test, they click on the little DNA guy, and it helps them order a genomics test. And if they want to be part of the molecular tumor board, once they've got it back, they hit the MTB icon. Any questions? Am I going too medical on you? Any physicians in the room, by the way? <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, all Yeah, we don't the, want to talk bad about them as they're here, just saying. They're all at the Yale talk. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm sorry, there was, a, there was a question, but it escaped me. Oh, that's okay. It'll come back to me. Yeah, yep. Yeah, we're like freaking frack up here, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, genomics is considered a clinical trial. So like any clinical trial, patients have to be contacted, the process is reviewed with them, patient is consented, biopsy samples are retrieved, and the accession or an other patient information is entered in the external vendor system's email, or their web portal. Now, this is diff makes it difficult then if they make a mistake to tie it back when we get the results back later, but we'll talk about that later. So the physical tumor is actually sampled and hand-delivered off to this lab where the genomes are sliced and diced and the genetic codes are resulted. And we get this lovely 26-page report back that no one wants to read. No, that really was the problem. No one wanted to read it, so that's why we had to do this other thing. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> that and the fact that those, those recommendations are the vendor's recommendations, and they don't match our evidence-based care, so we didn't want the physicians to actually use those. And then they have to go through this horrible report to try and find the relevant information. So the original ask from the customer was we wanted a spot to hold our molecular tumor board information, so we built them a SharePoint. Um, and Which is the only place we could build them. Yeah, so it's a good secure spot. Yeah. It's uh, Just for the technology part, we're a Microsoft shop mainly, and we basically just use the things, the only things that were available to us. That was what was kind of interesting about this whole solution, as you'll see a little bit uh, further on, is in order to securely show the data to the dot, because you can't, you know, you have to, you have to control that. It's pretty, it's very important to protect the privacy of your patients. Uh, SharePoint, uh, SharePoint Online was our only option. So, but you'll see more of that later. So docs can log in, they see only their patients. And we have a genetics expert, Dr. F, who was PhD, Dr. F, not Dr. Dr. F. Um, who was going through and he would, she was manually summarizing all the relevant results in the 26 page report for each patient and then manually matching them up to clinical trials, which was driving her insane. So how does it all happen? Well, in a large bureaucracy, the three favorite words in the English language are proof of concept. We like to fly under the radar. Well, that's in case we fail. We don't want anybody to know. No, that's we, we, did we didn't fail. Yeah, so it could happen. <laughs> so Lance, who's a genius at organizing and getting people to pay for stuff, uh, got... Is Microsoft in the room anywhere? <laughs> Thank you. I got them to pay for the two-week POC, by the way, with the, with the credits. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's why we love him. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to automate the process of retrieving the genetic information from the vendor site, putting it onto uh, our HDI Insight cluster, and then we envisioned putting it back up into Office 365. Uh, we did it with four people, uh, plus a consultant that Lance got Two of got the four up here right now. Two yeah. of the four up here now. We all had day jobs. I was working on 14 other projects. How many other projects were you working on? Only 10, I don't work yeah. that hard. Yeah. Uh, with what we learned at last year's conference, lessons learned from the previous Hadoop, not quite Yeah, so we had successful. a few other uh, false starts uh, previously as yeah. well. We even tried an on-prem one that didn't go well. So yeah. Ask me about that later. <laughs> I, I, no, I won't say anything bad, Stacey. Don't. It was not with Hortonworks, exactly. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the distribution. <laughs> so um, this is our Microsoft HDI cluster. It's tiny, it's mighty, and he still is so cheap that he scales it up and down on the weekends and yeah. overnight. Yeah, that's the value of using Azure. We can you know, scale it up and down and being, being virtual. Cannot believe how cheap he is. Yep. So from the Microsoft. Oh, by the way, you guys can ask questions. Oh, yeah, go There's ahead. not lots of us in here, so yeah. go ahead. Oh, wait, oh, I'm sorry. Did I do something wrong? Yeah. Oh, now you're making Roxy run. You can ask the question. I'll repeat it. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, so have yes. you had problems scaling them down, and how, yes. how do you do it? Uh, yes, I've had problems because I didn't know how to do it, but Microsoft, actually the support folks were pretty helpful with us on that, and we basically use the run books. I'll be glad to talk to you a little bit more detail about how to do it, but it has worked pretty, pretty well, so. Although we do have to have, you made extra run books now for weekends because you just wanted to turn it off on the weekends. Yes, exactly. I mean, the, the value of being virtual uh, with this particular, in the particular way that we're doing it is that the compute and the storage are completely separate. So I can turn everything off. Our next step in this particular, right now we're scaling it down to like three nodes because it doesn't really like, it won't scale up well if you go to two, by the way. <laughs> so you got to keep it at three. Uh, but our, our next thing that we will end up doing is actually just tearing the whole thing down and then, and then just rebuilding it when we need it and, and actually scheduling that, so. Yeah, so. with those ARM templates? Yeah, using templates and, yeah. yeah. So Office 365 used to, it's now depreciated, offer something called web apps, which allowed you to instantiate a Azure SQL Server database behind your SharePoint for free now it's gone to Power Apps and you have to pay for it. Um, but Power Apps isn't HIPAA compliant yet, so we can't move to it. 
Q3 this year, hopefully, fingers crossed. Basically, it made an Azure SQL Server database that you can access using any regular SQL Server tools um, at, through the back end, and it has an access-esque as, access uh, front end that lets you develop the forms and create a little app that gets shared on SharePoint. So you have a whole, poof, you have an app from a database with like no work whatsoever, and it works pretty well. So our data flow architecture, and one of the things about, we were new last year, and then this year we come back and there's all these great tools for moving stuff from point A to point B. Well, those didn't exist last year, and Mr. I hate to commit, said yep. we weren't allowed to use anything that was absolutely Azure specific, because we needed to be able to move if we were gonna switch vendors. Sorry to my Microsoft friends in the back. <laughs> so. <laughs> we're still there though, so don't We're worry. still there. So what we have is the vendor who's doing all those actual tests has a cloud. And on their cloud, they've got the PDFs that nobody wanted but we had to bring down. Um, something called the BAM files, the FASTQ files, the VCF files, all the genomic results files. That's the genomic sequence data. Those are really big. That was actually a driver for us using cloud storage because we didn't have a place to put it. So we're storing all of the all of those, uh, all the genomic sequence, they're pretty large files, we grab them every day. Uh, nobody's, uh, they're having, not really doing any data science on it right now, but that was a request from the data scientists, PhD folks over in the oncology space to be able to use that. So it's, they're available when they're ready, so. Yeah. And then we've got our other cloud, the Azure HDI Insight Interoperability Cluster. And we've got to push all the PDFs and all the raw data onto that so that we can do a bunch of data manipulation to match up the clinical trials that the patients were going to be eligible for, as well as finding the right Mrs. Smith from all the Mrs. Smiths who are registered at CHS because we need to send back clinical data with our center of excellence pieces. So, and then we have a third cloud which was Office 365, where we wanted to do the presentation layer to the providers, and we have to move data, the sort of transformed data, as well as the PDFs up to that cloud. So today's world, that'd be easy. In our world last year, not so much. That wasn't that hard. So for the documents that contain the, the different information and the clinical trials, were you using some sort of unstructured text processing, or were you just using regexes, or how were you pulling that data out so we got raw test results from the actual machines. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just moving the files. We're actually doing some NLP stuff in a whole separate, or exploring yeah. it in a whole separate area. Yeah. And if anybody's, uh, natural language processing, anybody's yeah. got some experience with that, I'd love to share our trials with that. Maybe, maybe you guys can teach me something on that. That was, that was the original ask, but we went to the vendor and said, look, you guys, we know you're using some sort of big data thing to create the PDF. Can't we just get the raw results? <laughs> The raw results come in uh, comma separated value files. Yeah. yeah. And, but then we also have all the other files. So we could go back, if we didn't believe one of the things, we can actually go back to the original BAM file and rerun, uh, reprocess it, and redevelop all the results as but, well. But you, we can bind that raw file, uh, remind me, because it, it's just been running for a while, so I haven't looked at it in a while. We combine that, that report with the other data in Hive and with all the queries that you'll see later yeah. to, to produce the output that goes to SharePoint. So that's kind of the trick of the cluster of, you know, create, we throw all this junk in Hive. Victoria has stressed Hive out. You will see this here in a minute. Uh, we're going to go to Spark because we've hit the limit. But I'll let you, I'll save that for your slide later. But, <laughs> but NLP, you might want to talk about that to me after. I'll be yeah, I'd love to talk to you. Love third to proof of concepts, the charm. That's what we keep telling yeah, ourselves. Exactly, yeah. Okay. One script to rule them all. So, Mr. 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 Let's not I commit. like Bash. I like Bash. Mr. So, like we, Bash. we did this whole thing using Cron, Bash, PowerShell, Scoop, Scoop. PowerShell Hive Hi. on the command line, and SQL on the command line. Yeah, we don't need no stinking graphic stuff. <laughs> and Real developers use the command line, I'm just saying. And it, and, it, and it emails us at three in the morning when it starts, and it emails us when it's done, and then we go, Lance, I didn't get my emails this morning, and then we check, because the email guys have, cut, have put some sort of filter in, so we can't get our emails. Exactly. <laughs> and the one conceit that, uh, concession that we got out of 
Lance, was that we didn't have to have one PowerShell script because otherwise we couldn't connect to the APIs in SharePoint to actually talk to SharePoint. Yeah. So we did get one sort of Microsoft specific piece. So what did we do? We scooped a bunch of stuff from all those different data sources, plus some other ones that weren't on that Yeah, picture. our data warehouse is in there. We have, we have a large data warehouse, so we scoop a lot of stuff out of there as well. The demographics for the patients and yep. other stuff around. Well. Demographics, visits, yep. those sorts of things. Then we have uh, a Hive, set of Hive queries, about 2,000 lines of code now, um, that uh, do all the patient matching and do the genomic test and genomic summary stuff. Then we do a bunch of scooping back where we scoop all the results back up into the Office 365 Azure SQL Server database. And then we drop a file that uh, triggers the uh, PowerShell to wander. And then when PowerShell has started uh, running, its final act is it dumps the PDFs up on the Office 365 site, which then generates a bunch of workflows in Office 365, which then finishes up the process. So when we look at that in context of the whole data life cycle for how we were managing the data for this client, we did uh, A through E on this slide in that HDI environment, which was basically moving it from the vendor onto our Office 365 while transforming it to have the data that we needed. Then we did F through I, which was moving uh, all the SharePoint pieces where we're doing auto notification, we're moving stuff around, we're um, uh, re <laughs> taking out the HTML formatting and putting it in a format that Microsoft likes for when it's displaying things. And then finally, that was the end of the proof of concept. And that's that two week consultation. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have any fallout from your patient matching algorithms and how you deal with that? <laughs> Do I have any follow-up from my patient matching algorithms and how do I deal with that? I had, um, I kept working on my matching algorithms until I came across the 82 who I couldn't match. Um, and then the 82 I couldn't match, um, I'm using a human intervention. So, um, and we'll get to it when we get to the web app slide, but I do have a spot where I can override and pre-match a patient that I'm never going to match because they've mistyped it in the vendor application, so the PDF has the name wrong. All the information on the genomics has the name wrong, but we know what the real name is. And you'll see that later on, on how all the stuff we had to, you had to set up in Hive to, like, yeah, to visits, do the, the doc. What, what do you use, like, the visits? I use the first name, last name, date of birth, the physician who ordered the test. To um, figure out if it's the right person. Yeah. That's kind of the magic of the cluster because, well, you'll see that in a minute. There's, yeah. a, lot of, there's a lot of crunching. There's a lot of crunching. It's kind of brute forcing a lot of it, but well, as you know, and figuring that kind of stuff out. So we did actually finish the rest of this life cycle where we're sending back results to the provider, but we didn't do it inside the proof of concept. So we sort of finished the proof of concept in I, and then we finished the rest of it up in the following year. So as Lance likes to say, it's all duct tapes and hamsters, and we're trying to operationalize it as we go. Uh, things like if uh, juniors, seniors, and thirds kill me because the space, they put those in the name, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, they make the matching impossible, and sometimes they put spaces in the names in the PDF, which kills Hive. In our base processes, we can't handle a space in the name. I'm supposed to fix that sometime, though. One day, yeah. one day in our copious amounts of free time. So I can't talk about all the really cool processing we do, but as Lance alluded to earlier, we munge the hell out of Hive. So this is, the la this is a picture of the last DAG just before I, uh, I think this is the last one just before I finally broke Visual Studio and I can no longer have DAG pictures. Um, Visual Studio has a hint and limit of no more than 255 reducers. This took 645 reducers. Um, and then I broke Hive. Hive right out of the box comes by default set up with 100,000 counters. And I need 100 and, well, I was crashing at 160,000 and now I'm at 190,000 and I'm not. So somewhere between those two numbers is how many counters I use in Hive. So 
Um, as Lance alluded to, we're, we're, at, the, we're at the limit. We're at the limit. So we'll, we'll be we're, introducing Spark and yeah, we're going to be rewriting it in Spark. Um, the portion, the these portions of it, the data matching portions, because sometimes you need a loop. I think yeah, is every, time, every while you need to do a four while loop. <laughs> Can't do everything in SQL. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, it certainly it runs. So that whole thing from picking up the FTPs all the way to putting it up into SharePoint, 27 minutes. What is in the SharePoint? So this is a web app in SharePoint. This is what it comes with out of the box. It's got a little table of contents. You pick the little charms, the little pictures on the side, and it generates, and then you can manipulate all the forms for the data viewing. So as I said, when we couldn't match a patient on here, I can manually override and put in what we're calling the universal master patient index number. So I had 82 folks whose names were so mangled there was no way I could figure out who they were. All of them had junior, senior, third, or a maiden name. <laughs> All of them. Uh, so this is the data we did, we pulled in the proof of concept. This is the data we're doing in the second wave. This is our planned data for the third wave. In between, while we're waiting for a data wave to complete, they can manually update, and anything they manually put on here is retained. It overrides anything that we would match um, from, the, from the data matching process. The other piece we did here was we can't let the providers into the data lake. Not that we don't trust them, but we don't want them touching that data. So where, this is where we use to let, this is how we let them define the clinical trial criteria. So this is a really flexible framework we built on them. It allows for lots of complexity. So they define a primary gene, in this case BRAF, um, what kind of test results, normalized test results were allowed to use for matching. In this case, it has to be pathogenic. And then whether or not we should include all mutations or only include specific mutations, or you could include all mutations but exclude specific mutations. Same thing for tumor sites, like where the tumor was from, and the kind of diagnosis the patient has. And then we added the complexity of correlated genes. So one of the clinical trials requires that the patient have a BRAS, NRAS, and KRAS wild type, which means they're normal, they're not mutated. Those are all genes, right? I never know what those things are. Those are, are all genes. Okay, thank you. And uh, so, this allows for the kind of complexity that they need to be able to do the clinical trials matching without us having to do any manual coding. They just put it in here with their X or and ors, and they, they say this is, an a, this is an and or this is an or, include or exclude, and then we've built logic that takes this framework and then includes or excludes all the patients. All with Hive. All with Hive. It's still amazing to me that that works. 2,000 so. lines of Hive. I'm sorry, go ahead. So he's asking, does someone have to manually abstract the data into here from the clinical trials? The answer, or does it magically happen? The answer is, today, someone manually does it, but part of our proof of concept for the NLP is to have it done automatically. Um, this is one of the genomic, the, this is the email that the SharePoint sends to the reviewer to review. Um, this is the view that the reviewer sees. This is actually a good example. It's probably hard to read here, but down, oh, there we are. So this person has to have a BRAF mutation, but they can't have a MEC1, MEC2, or, a, an, N, uh, or an NRAS mutation in order to be eligible for that clinical trial. And as you can see, we had to have specialized notation. She likes particular spacing. There, it had to look like it looked when she wrote it manually. It had to be formatted, it couldn't, it had to look pretty. When she says it's okay, uh, the genomic doctor, um, then a doctor goes, a note automatically gets sent to the ordering provider letting him know he has a report that's available. And then he logs onto the SharePoint and now sees the now live auto-generated version of the report. So what's happening in HDI? And Lance said, I can't go into detail on this slide because you'll all fall asleep. Yes, you but, can thank me later. <laughs> in my just shy of 2,000 lines of Hive, the white box 
represents all that data, initial data cleaning you end up having to do, where you're trying to get rid of the quotations, the characters that are going to mess up everything else you want to do, your line feeds, all those things that are just not happy. The orange group, oh, come back. The orange group there represents, uh, we're matching patients. Uh, so we're finding the right Mrs. Smith from all the possible Mrs. Smiths. The green and teal boxes represent the clinical trials matching algorithm, and you have to do that first. So the blue represents the summary, and it's by summary, it by definition doesn't have every result. So it's an abbreviation of the results. And if the gene that triggers you to be in the clinical trial isn't part of the regular summary, you have to add it. So that BRAS, KRAS, NRAS, all wild type or normal, wouldn't be on the summary normally. But if you're gonna have a clinical trial that says you're eligible because of that, you have to show that in the summary. So you have to figure out what the clinical trials are before you do the summary, because you add that into the summary. And then the purple represents all the sort of housekeeping bits we had to add in order to match everything up when we got up onto the SharePoint. Does that make sense to everybody? So to find the right Mrs. Smith, we have to compare every patient registered at CHS, which is just over six million. We said we were a little large. Um, against all patient visits for the last five years, and I don't know if you remember it from the very first slide, we do 12 and a half million visits a year. Um, to find the, provide, the patient who has the same last name, first name, date of birth, who's had a visit with that provider in roughly the time frame when the test we think would have been ordered. Because we don't know the ordering date, and all we know from the res results we receive is who ordered it, when it was received, and the name and date of birth of the patient. Why do we have to look back five years if it's a recent test? Because they are constantly sending us backfill data. So we're getting data all the way back to 2010. And just randomly it'll show up, because the vendor's like that. Okay, every run, uh, every day we run over a million, uh, we got a million test results that we run through and match against up to 90 clinical trials. It was a million at the end of April, and we are getting a few thousand every day added into that, and that's just solid tumor. When we go to liquid tumor, which we're adding in probably in two months, we're gonna have triple that volume every day on the um, results side. What did we achieve? Well, here's a proof of concept. So we, on April 29th, we had Stacy and Berin come in and explain what the heck a dupe was to our clinical trials folks the first time. Well, that was the second time because the first time we had the fire alarm, right? Exactly. And then we couldn't have the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we defined what the proof of concept was in mid-May. Then Lance worked his magic and got everything paid for and found some folks and did all that piece. We decided we'd wait until after the conference because we wanted to come to this conference, take pre-event training, see what was going on here, and then take some online courses. And then we started at the sort of mid, two-thirds of the end of July, and we worked one week with the consultant intensely, four of us plus the consultant in the room. We spent a week working all by ourselves. Then we brought the consultant back for one more week because we were only allowed to have two weeks because Microsoft was cheap. And then we started our first. They left already. You can't. It doesn't help now. They're we done. did our we did our first full live run the week after the consultant left, and we've been running ever since. We ran in parallel. That meant Dr. F was still manually checking. She was manually transcribing data, and so we were getting more and more cases to check against. She was checking, and then she would look at what we had done and critique. And at the end of uh, October, she said that we were close enough to what she wanted to do that we could, she would just edit. So she was no longer going to review them but from even scratch. Before that, but even before that, she, we, were, we were finding, this was finding stuff that she yeah. couldn't find yeah, like she, six months before that. So. Yeah, almost so. like the first run we looked at, we're like, well, we found this one, but you didn't. And she's like, oh, you're right, that one was there. <laughs> so we were finding trials she wasn't noticing by hand. Any so, PhD data science people in here? Yeah. Yeah, they're very particular, by the way. That's who this yes. Dr. F is. If yeah. she heard me here, thank you for making us stronger. Yes, basically. she definitely did. So providers can now get their genomic reports. They don't have to hunt through scanned reports. The genomic reports are available for group review. Patients got enrolled in clinical trials. And Dr. F was actually at 
the um, Society for Clinical Oncology annual conference in Chicago earlier this month, which is like the, was it? Well, we say the Apple World in Oncology, yeah. whatever that is. Yeah, they're at the huge oncology conference. She presented this exact thing from a clinician's perspective, and they said that they found that 70% of the patients who presented at Molecular Tumor Board actually had their treatment changed based on the recommendations that were happening in this Molecular Tumor Board. So what else did we get? Well, from an IT side, we got a flexible framework. We were able to expand out to other projects, like LADS, the Legacy Access Database Project. I'm sure none of you have access databases you want to get rid of. We did. <laughs> Those things that were built by summer interns or somebody's nephew that die in the middle of everything, and suddenly doctors are screaming at you because they're holding 10 years' worth of data that they can only put there. So we built a generic version of Keras data tables to hold generic data. And then we put in a specific table that matched the data that they had for their access database specifically. And then we changed their database into one of these web app databases. And we set up a nightly download. So we back it up each night. We've got the same pipes we've already built to munge data. And we're putting in data that helps them maintain the right Mrs. Smith by using visit data for patients who are visiting them. And uh, updates any other data like medications that is available so that they do less manual entry and we have less calls. Don't, so what did we learn? We learned don't try and build the world. Start with something small and specific. Grow, prove that you can have a success because that was the big failure for the other two Hadoop attempts. And learn as you go, keep it simple so you can reuse it. And we did learn that the, uh, I mean, we, we did make an attempt at an on-prem um, and what I learned was that this, it's really a big, for those of you who have Hadoop on-prem, I know you could, you didn't, you didn't ever have the luxury of virtualized environments in, not in the too distant past, but we have that luxury. As a matter of fact, at our system, our CIO is getting us out of the data center. It's cloud first, mobile first. So I couldn't have even built an on-prem if I wanted to. They wouldn't let you put it in the data center. But the happy consequence of that is that the virtualized environment that we're able to use with Microsoft was very flexible and, and we could, um, you know, and it wasn't too big. That, I mean, it's visible over in the oncology space, so we're kind of, you know, we're, we did something successful, but it's not too big yet. But based on that success, it's not too big that four of us can't manage it. But based on that success, I'm kind of getting on the edge. I'm getting a little worried if it would be a victim of my own success or our own success. Anyway, that's it. Any other questions before we have to hand the room over? Yeah. And we'll hang around too. If you, yeah. I'm happy. You, I'm happy most of you stayed. I'm like surprised. Like, wow, this is exciting. Yeah. Just have one quick question. So obviously, there's a lot of advantages to move to the cloud and taking advantage of the past offerings that you guys have done here with HG Insights and tools like that. But one of the biggest struggles you know we have internally and our clients have is understanding the security and the risk that go along with this. I mean, standing up infrastructure on the cloud and having your same control framework on-prem onto the cloud is, you know, easier to do and, and, and can happen. So from a security perspective, storing this, you know, confidential data out there, using these platform as a service offerings, which are inherently a little bit more risky and more of the onus is on the provider of Microsoft, how did you guys sort of manage that, that cycle of risk and security to get the approval to move forward with this? Uh, that's a great point. Uh, well, first of all, we had the... Add, uh, Microsoft has a BAA with us, right? So they're in on it with the risk, and, and, we, and we had our security folks with us the whole time because I'm uber worried about that because I like my job. So, uh, so, so we always had those guys with us side by side. However, uh, you bring up a good point. Uh, the what, the re one of the other reasons you see this working this way is that, is that we, there's only like four or five of us to actually get in the cluster. We, our security right now, until until our infrastructure matures some with the with between the day we do have a data center between the data center and what's in Azure, and getting that more connected, uh, we basically do a secret society. We don't really let. There's only like three or four of us that actually can get in to that data. So as you see all the crunching of the data that goes on, we push it out to the SharePoint. That's where the security is managed. The rest of it's managed by the fact that we just don't let you in there. And I've been very clear about that with the security folks, and that's one of the things I talk to, talk to others when they see this, it sounds cool and they want to expand it. That's the very first thing I say. So, well, we got to get the domain controller and all, and, and all that stuff settled because we're not going to go, we're not going to, we're not going to be able to scale it well 
Uh, it's good for these purposes, and we have some other ones that are growing, but they're good for this pattern. They're not, it's not gonna be as good until they get the security right in Azure, so. And the SharePoint security is the only thing that connects us yeah. outside. Everything else is stuck inside our VM. Our, 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 like you have to be on our WAN in order to access this. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, VPN and, and um, you're locked out based on the firewall rules that we set up for you. So we keep you locked out pretty, and we had that review by our security folks because we're not security people. But uh, we're, we're moving pretty fast to fix that, you know, to remedy that at Carolinas, but right now, that's how we manage it. using Bob Storage, sometimes the keys are accessible by Microsoft, so you have to like interchange those keys out, and some components can be wrapped around a firewall, and some can't because Microsoft owns certain part of those PaaS offerings. So again, I think to your point, it might be your specific use case and how you're locking it down, but we run into a lot of, a lot of challenges in, in, in the PaaS uh, offerings to, to, yeah, to meet the same security requirements. That we're, we're very familiar with the issue of the keys, and, and uh, now I don't know the, the, um, the ADL, the Azure Data Lake is now HIPAA compliant, so we're gonna be migrating away from blob storage to that for those, for those very reasons. reasons. Yeah. yeah. For, yeah also, also, just so you can do uh, the analytics directly against it if you want to, so, yeah. Thank you so, oh, one more. One more and then we have to leave. You, you can't ask any questions? You have to well, go I get just, your I staff. think, and actually, I'm, this isn't like really a Hortonworks or Hadoop question. This is more a cloud question or for you just to kind of speak to the power of the cloud. There's the aspect of being able to scale up, scale down, and separate the compute from the storage and so forth in the flexibility of the cloud. But also, there's the operational aspect at, C at Carolina's Healthcare of how you did this so much faster in the cloud and how you were able to be way more agile because it didn't, didn't engage all these different teams and infrastructure groups and so on and so forth at Carolina's Healthcare. Do you want to speak maybe to just from a process, people process standpoint, how the cloud, cloud enabled you to do this more well, quickly? Well, there's actually two things to that. The use case lended itself to being able to do what you said. Um, for ex I'll give you a use case that I don't think would lend itself to that. We have a large data warehouse we use Natiza. We stage all of our data there from our, from our um, operational systems. I don't think I could have done this. I couldn't have, I couldn't have built a data lake for staging my EDW with this, right? Just because of all the security aspects and it's so much bigger, right? Uh, but, for the, but for our needs here, uh, it worked great, and as a matter of fact, even once, uh, my, my, my belief is, is even once we get maybe, let's say I had a really large one on-prem or I did it somewhere else, and I still had Azure, I might still use Azure for this kind of thing, right? And I might still, uh, for example, I have someone from Audit and Compliance talking to us for a project that they want to do. So it's good for departmental mid, that's my view any right, way right now, good for departmental mid-level uh, mid size type thing where you can spin it up and be very agile. You don't really know how you're gonna solve the problem, so you can move back and forth really quick. That's, that's good. That, that's, a good, that's a good pattern for that use case. But if I were to build something more permanent for in my EDW, in my data warehousing layer, where I'm landing all my Cerner data, all my Epic data, and all that kind of stuff, I probably, it's, it's gonna be a whole, that's gonna be a whole different animal, it, and it'd have, to be, it'd have to be managed differently. And our infrastructure folks, they have a lot of challenges now just trying to get out of the data center, so eventually we're all gonna be one happy family dealing with on-prem and off-prem. It's just uh, growing pains that we're having right now, that's all. All right, thanks so much for coming. Yeah.